as David said, I'm Mike Cusack, and uh, along with Ransford, we're from New Brunswick, Canada. We're on the uh, on the East Coast. We're here to talk about centers of excellence, which really are to support uh, post-secondary readiness and connected opportunities in various sectors of the economy. So I'm Mike, and I look after our distance learning program here in the province. I, I lead a team of online teachers to deliver distance courses, and I look after cooperative education. And along with Ransford, I am co-leading this uh, Center of Excellence initiative. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ransford Lockhart. I'm very excited and pleased to be here. Uh, I, similar to Mike, am a learning specialist as well. My big focus is on strategic partnerships, so engaging with provincial partners to provide and support experiential learning opportunities across our province, as well as experiential learning. I lead a team of four district experiential learning coordinators in all four of our Anglophone school districts. And I, along with Mike, am co-leading the Center of Excellence Initiative. Before we dive into this, we just want to give you some context on where we're presenting from. You know, New Brunswick is situated on the east coast of Canada, small in nature, with a population of just over 780,000, as characterized by a 50-50 urban and rural split. New Brunswick is unique in the fact that it is Canada's only officially bilingual province. It has two school systems, one francophone and one anglophone, and for the purpose of this presentation, we'll highlight the anglophone school system which has a strong system commitment to inclusion and has over 200 schools. Yet, you know, New Brunswick is not without its challenges. You know, currently the province is facing two big areas of difficulty, one being population and the next one being labor market. In regards to population, the province is the oldest province in Canada. Now, this is not necessarily a bad thing. You know, seniors provide a wide range of wealth or of knowledge and resources that can be imparted on to the next generation. However, here in the province, our, our youth are leaving, which further compounds the labor market issue that we're having. We're projecting 120,000 job openings in the next 10 years and key labor shortages in, in key sectors across the province. What New Brunswick needs is for people to come and live within the province. And it needs the current population to truly be aware of the career opportunities available directly within our province. Education is not without its challenges either. You know, COVID-19 has seen an increased demand placed upon teachers who are seeing a decreased level of engagement from their students. Further areas of stress to the system include access to providing equitable opportunities that support teacher practice and student learning. This issue is further compounded by the difficulty for partners to be able to scale up engagement beyond their individual schools. All right. And so, and so that leads us to a bit of an equation of what do we need to do uh, to kind of close some of these gaps. And so we feel that if we can increase student and teacher focus on career connected learning, right, to make all teachers, you know, able to teach and talk about career education, uh, it'll, it, it'll help us move things forward. And to the point about teachers being busy, you know, and you think about six degrees of separation and, and, and those kind of analogies. If we can remove the barriers for teachers to connect with experts, we'll really be able to, you know, make it easier for them to just connect with people who are out in the world doing the things that, you know, that, that they do. And so the equal sign here gets to this piece. We want students to know that they can make a living and a life in New Brunswick. And to do that, Right. They need to know what all the options are. And if you talk to students, they'll you know, they know in healthcare, they know doctor and they know nurse. But, you know, our resident attendant and BSW and all these other careers, those some of those things are, are cloudy to them. Right. So this is a chance to you know, open the curtain a little bit. And so before we go, the next slide really gets into the center of excellence piece, but we did want to address, there have been a number of other initiatives happening in the province. And so at a ministerial level, we revised our graduation policy and our policy on experiential learning. And so these things make it uh, easier and you see options for credit. We've added more ways students can earn a diploma, right? Recognition for prior credit, personal interest courses, and also made it easier for students to get out of the buildings and into the community and into the workforce and to kind of have a taste of uh, what's out there. 
uh, we've developed some co-op programs that combine you know, online learning or sort of cohort-based classroom learning with an experience to have reflective practice. Uh, added options for co-op virtually so we can connect people with mentors who are remote, remote to them. And then again, some strategic pieces. So we added a strategic partnership unit to the Department of Education and Early Childhood Development to onboard partners to draft and, and, and sign agreements. And then this experiential learning uh, unit as well. But today, uh, the idea is to talk about centers of excellence. And so this year, and partly into the previous school year, uh, we are launching four centers of excellence in energy, health, entrepreneurship, and the digital economy, which really is all things sort of ICT related. And so why these centers? Uh, our feeling is that they're, they're very cross-curricular in nature. So, you know, if you had a physics center, <clears throat> that would be of interest to physics teachers. But with energy, you can, you can work with energy in physics classes or math classes. You can use language arts. You can have debates and discussions about, you know, types of energy. So it's, it's really applicable all throughout. Uh, all of these areas had advocates in other areas of government to really see these drive ahead. And we have uh, a group in the province called Opportunities New Brunswick, and these align to their four strategic areas for growth. So there was labor market information to back up uh, these choices. There were partners who were interested in working with us and other initiatives, right? One of our, our, our largest university is starting a, uh, a center for digital health in one of the cities. And so again, just strong alignment opportunities. And then that last piece, the foundational bit, really, if you think about it, other than talking about the weather, these are things that people talk about a lot, right? You know, this, what we're doing right now wouldn't be possible without energy or technology or the businesses that put these things together. And of course, none of us would be here if our health was in question. So they're really foundational to, to so much of our, of our society and economy. What this slide is, is the model that makes the Center of Excellence possible. So what the centers do, they act as a centralized link between our sector specific partners and the education system to support experiential and virtual learning opportunities. Currently, we're working with over 20 signed partners to provide support for the Centers of Excellence. These partners provide us with a secondary reach and access to over 2,500 companies across the province. The centers have a K-12 lens and are available to all Anglophone schools in the province, as well as the First Nation band operated schools. The centers also provide Francophone resources and really truly aim to support our French immersion program. So the big question is, how does this work? If a sector specific partner would, desires to have an opportunity or resource shared within the center, that resource goes from the partner directly to the center. And that center lead, their mission is to essentially educationalize that resource and make it digestible and edible for the, for the school system. From a school system perspective, how it works is this. If the school system has a request that the center can actionize, that request goes from the school system directly to the center. And that center works with its coalition of partners to operationalize that request. As you can see under the center lead, that center lead is supported by two big buckets, a website and supports. Each center will have its own center of excellence specific website and has a wide range of EECD supports to really help ensure that these centers are successful. So what this means from a partner's perspective, it really provides a unique opportunity to scale impact and contributions. It shifts the historical perception of, you know, I work in Town X, so I can only work with students who live in Town X to I work in Town X, and through the center, I can work with all students, all teachers across our province. And from an education perspective, this model really truly provides equitable access to resources. Students in rural New Brunswick now have access to the same resources as students in our provincial capital. Yeah, we have a saying that we like to throw around, it's education is everybody's business. And, you know, so across government, I mean, we've worked with, you know, probably seven other government departments, health, social development, energy, our post-secondary, and so we're really bringing people in and, and, and giving them access to, to schools to, to collaborate. So what makes the center possible? Um, we really need three big buckets. Bucket number one is, is people. We need someone to staff the center. Currently, with the three centers that we have operational, 
those centers are staffed by, by a teacher who are being paid kind of a 50-50 split between our partners and from the department. We also need access to expertise. You know, without partners, we don't have centers. Centers for, partners really provide the meat of what these centers can offer directly to the school system. As well as we need, you know, operational cost. We need funding, funding to cover such things as center specific events, um, kits that can be sent out to schools, as well as being able to allow teachers to access professional learning that is directly relatable to what these centers can provide. All right, so that's sort of the, that's the structure. And now this really is the learning model. And so the, you know, the cornerstone is that it's curriculum focused. And so we had, you know, two things that we, we, we knew we wouldn't move away from. And one was, was you know, to have something across K to 12, right? To target all the levels. It's very easy for some initiatives to fall into targeting one range and, and high school in particular very often. But we wanted to work across K-12 and we wanted it to be tied to the curriculum. We wanted to, in terms of working with partners, well, a traditional criticism is that you fall victim to their mandate, right? You're suddenly, you know, teaching corporate agenda or something. And so we really, uh, everything is based on the curriculum and it's not about replacing what you're doing. Uh, it's about augmenting it and using more uh, you know, contemporary examples from the workforce. And so you see these three layers, foundational awareness. And so, and you'll see in the next slide, some examples of each of these, but foundational awareness is just bringing things into the consciousness of students, right? Having them be aware of things. And, and so we talk about, we met with the hospital uh, corporation and they said there are students who like physics and there are students who are interested in a career in medicine and they're not the same kids. If you could close that gap, students could understand that there are options there. Active exploration is really a project-based, problem-based learning, right? It's about giving students something to do that someone in the workforce actually does. So it could be some a, a lab work example that a biology class might do for a period of days, right? It's, it's doing those things. And then the career readiness piece is all across. And I know Tricia and Andrew are here and I, I'll leave that for them. But, you know, there are portfolio tools and pieces across our system that we're promoting. But particularly in high school, it's about closing the gap, as we heard in the last few days, right, about what my intentions are, aligning them with my actions. So having students know what courses they want to take, which programs are there. And so we're giving post-secondary really direct access to talk to students about all of their programs. There, there are you know, lists and comprehensive ways that the students can find out about, about what's happening. A lot of words here uh, on this slide and we won't read them all for sure, but just a few examples. So we put kits in schools uh, for a wind energy challenge and middle school students are doing math and science and research and creative thinking to, de to develop uh, windmill blades, right, turbine blades, and they're testing them. They're measuring the results and trying to optimize their uh, physics to, you know, produce the most energy. And they're competing with other schools and they're sharing, you know, images and, and data and findings about that. Uh, nuclear Science Week, we do have a nuclear generating station in the province. Um, so we did pull to, we pulled together a number of experts across probably close to two dozen companies and partners and put live presentations on through the week so that every day of the week there were one or more sessions about uh, what's going on in the world of nuclear energy. We recorded them all and now they're available on demand to students to watch. And again, long-term care co-op, I did mention that earlier, but students basically are able to come out of high school trained to work in a nursing home environment. And many students are using that as a springboard to go into programs like nursing. Um, oh, a little bit of delay there. And so Ransom mentioned that every center will have a site and you can see here, the energy site is up currently. And uh, some other sites will be coming along here in the coming, in the coming month. Okay, so this is the uh, kind of the timeline of what we've been doing. And we did work for quite a while in the background to, you know, talk with partners, see who was interested, find out what, you know, what people wanted to do. And to kind of build 
build that background of uh, what the opportunities were. We had to do, you know, all kinds of kind of internal pitches and solicit partners and, you know, secure funding and do these pieces. And as if we jump, you know, to the end there, the viability. So we're in a two year window to really determine, you know, the viability of this. And so we'll know we're successful, I think, if there's, you know, a call for a fifth center. And so uh, in the middle of last year, our lead for the energy center uh, started work. The uh, health center and entrepreneurship center, those leads started uh, at the beginning of this school year. And we added an implementation lead to work specifically with schools to onboard them to the ideas you know, of this initiative. And then you can see those bigger icons are the centers and the timelines of when they launch. So we'll see uh, health and entrepreneurship, those websites come online at the beginning of December. And then the Digital Technology Center will come on uh, shortly thereafter into the second part of the school year. So how are we measuring success? You know, we are very um, bought into this idea and this concept, but we really want to ensure that we have the data to back it up to show that we're actually moving the needles that we want to move. As you can see on the slide, we really have kind of five big buckets we're looking at. Um, we internally as a team, we've developed KPIs, internal KPIs that we'll be tracking. Some of the things that we'll be looking at is really the reach. You know, we market these centers as a K to 12 initiative. We really wanna ensure that we're generating opportunities, activities for teachers and students to access that do reach the whole spectrum. We're also looking at engagement from teachers and students. We wanna ensure that teachers and students that are system is utilizing the resources that, this, that these centers can provide. And on top of that, we are moving towards capturing the voice of students, teachers, and our employers. We wanna ensure that as this initiative evolves, that you know, this, the teacher and student voice will help kind of allow that evolution to, to occur. As Mike alluded to, you know, we're in a two year window. Uh, following the two years, you know, we'd like to see this fully funded by outside partners. So as such, ensuring that partners are satisfied with what this initiative can offer, it's, it's critical. The fifth bucket you see is our assessment framework. So we've partnered with the Brunswick Institute for Research, Training and Design to develop an assessment framework that each center will use. The first center to use it will be the Center of Excellence for, for Energy. And that will include analyzing such things as sector specific knowledge, engagement in education, and the influence the COEs will have on encouraging students to stay in, in the province. Yeah, we felt that external piece was really important um, so that we, you know, to have an, some objective measures. And, and I know the center of excellence, you know, the, the phrase is, you know, there's centers of excellence for all kinds of things. But, uh, you know, we, we landed on that because it was just sort of broad and, and simple. And in terms of, uh, you know, the number of centers and the, you know, the, the planning, you know, the work, oops, the work is ongoing. And so that's that concludes the slide portion. And so if you have questions, we'd love to uh, love to, to take them on.